start with, uh, uh, good friend Dick Dunbar, the commander of the Legion, has a short statement to make here. I, I never agreed to make a short statement. I never have in my life. But uh, anyway, for those that don't know me, I've been post commander here. Uh, I did six years, took a year off, came back this year, and. Uh, we're very proud of the American Legion that we have here. We are the largest American Legion in the state of Indiana. For anybody that doesn't know that, I always like to put that out. Thank you. And we also have the largest uh, uh, auxiliary unit in the state of Indiana. So, but, but our total membership, we have about 25 or 100 members with the family of three, our uh, sons and the auxiliary and the post. But, Anyway, I'm not here to exactly talk about all that, except, except I will like to tell everyone, you know, the Legion will be 100 years old next year, of 1919 to 2019. So you'll be hearing more and more about that. We want to get that word out, let uh, people know what the Legion has done over the years with uh, uh, helping to establish the VA and uh, uh, a lot of the different programs that the veterans are used today. Uh, when they came back from World War II, uh, a lot of the loans that were made that helped rebuild the economy, the Legion really fought for those benefits. So we're all proud of that. But I do want to say uh, every every meeting Mike gets up here and or George and thanks the American Legion. Well, I think it was time for the American Legion to say thank you to Mike and George and all the guys that have brought this program out here. And we are happy to have you. There was some confusion about the food service. Uh, we had a lot of people step up today to make this work without doing a food bar because I thought you folks probably weren't going to be as accepting of a food bar as we had hoped maybe it would be. But uh, Shondell, or one of the waitresses, everybody knows Shondell. Sharon Grubbs came in today to help out. Um, Terry Lane, Terry is a, a, a great volunteer out here. He's a Marine veteran and uh, he, he's stepped up the last few months to do a lot of good things here. So anyway, I hope you enjoy your meal today, and we're going to try to keep the uh, the menu going. We may go to a more limited menu at some time, but the food bar, I think, uh, when I've talked to people out here, I, I don't think they think the food bar would work as well for them. So I see a lot of people shaking their heads. So uh, anyway, we're, we're glad to have you. Uh, it's been a, a, a great uh, partnership with the history guys. Uh, most of them that I, uh, my whole class of 64, I think practically comes out for this, these programs. So, and uh, I can't lie about my age to this group like I usually do. So, anyway, we're glad to have you. If you have any questions, uh, I would like to say, you know, if you're not a member here you, and you're a veteran or you're a son of a veteran or a daughter, uh, we'd love to talk to you about membership. I'll be around uh, uh, today. To love to talk to you. Any of you that's not a member, but uh, also, if you're not a member, we're open every day for lunch to the public from 11 to 3, so you can come in any time for lunch. If you, uh, if you like what you had today, well, I come back some other days, okay? Anyway, I'll turn it back over to Mike. But thanks again, everybody, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to mention my mother, Mary Carter, is here again. She's a big regular. Uh, wife, Paulette's here. In addition, my brother-in-law, Phil Taylor, just flew in from Rochester just to come to this show. So that's amazing. Should be some kind of award for that. And then I've uh, got some first cousins here, Nat, uh, Bernie, and Penny. They've been my first cousins for a long time. <laughs> there may be second cousins here, too. In Monroe County, who knows, you know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Next, I'd like to have David Lemon make a couple of comments. David is a former presenter, by the way. Uh, maybe future, I don't know, but former anyway. <laughs> I have to make up something. Um, my name is David Lemon. I'm with the. I volunteer at the uh, Monroe County History Center and. Uh, Anyway, um, there are some events coming up that you might be interested in. Uh, on November 14th, the History Center is sponsoring a, tr a bus trip to the Levi, Co Co Levi and Catherine Coffin uh, Underground Railroad site. And uh, 
Bits uh, from 8.30 to 7, $68 for members, $78 for non-members. That includes food and beverages and maybe a bathroom stop. So that's November 14th. Uh, November 4th, which is this Sunday, 4 to 5.30, and this is through the cemetery committee, there's going to be a... Uh, there's going to be a, a presentation concerning the symbolism and icon, iconogra what's that? iconography yes, that's right. iconography of headstones. So that's at 4 to 5.30 at the History Center. Finally, um, last Saturday we had a scan-a-thon in Ellettsville. Uh, folks brought in old photos and documents and so on that we scanned for our collections and which would give them a lasting uh, um, lasting source to see what they've had in photos and so on and, and, and without any worry of, of uh, deterioration. We're going to do this in uh, several different places. The next time is December first at the History Center and it's for more for the Bloomington area and we will scan 10 items add them to our collections give the originals back to you and uh, I think it's a really great event we're going to do we're going to try to do this Unionville and Steinsville Smithville so uh, that's all I had I have these uh, I have bro brochures up here and uh, Talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks, David. George, you want to bring you the microphone or you want to come up? Oh, yeah, I'll just bring it up here. All right. <laughs> Special dispensation for George. And I'm, what, the Minister of Propaganda? Yeah, Minister of Propaganda. <laughs> Did y'all been getting your emails? Yeah. yeah. Except the one lady that stopped me and said, hey, she hadn't been gotten getting hers and we took care of that. Uh, there's a little bit of confusion going on. It's all Mike's fault. Uh, so we, we have to keep track of that. It's, I like standing up so I can see you all back here and back too. So. Uh, let's see, I have a list here. I'd like to introduce my wife, Mary. Thank you all for coming, helping us preserve and remember history. I want to thank the Legion, although the Legion's got a lot of thanks today. Uh, between now and the next time we meet will be the 100th anniversary of November 11th, the end of the Great War. Uh, my grandfather was a charter member of this post. My father's picture is out on the west wall there on one of the American Legion color cards, I grew up in the in post-18. And being part of the American Legion is very important to me and very important to this community. There isn't a whole lot of other places we can in this community be able to come in, get free parking, get a good meal, get a master's level uh, short class on history is what we get here. I want to be, you to be generous to our servers, always. Uh, it's, this is not easy work. I wouldn't want it. And always, you know, I always thank cats because uh, we're going to have them come in after the first of the year, and they're going to give a presentation on what they do, and you will be amazed at the uh, uh, different uh, uh, opportunities that they offer within their organization and the different places that they go to document what's going on in Bloomington. Lastly, <coughs> emails. If you're not on our email list and would like to be, please see me at the end of, the con uh, of this presentation. If you're on the email list and wish it would go away, let me know that too. <laughs> Okay, are there any comments, questions, criticism for the good of the cause? Well, then I'll turn the mic back over to Mike. Oh, you don't have to.
to applaud me. I mean, you ought to applaud Mike occasionally, too. He, wor he, he worries about it. <laughs> or you're applauding Mike. <laughs> Well, just a quick rundown of what's coming up here. We're booked about a year ahead, amazingly. Uh, November 27th, 2018, uh, the History Center with Director Susan Dyer will give a program on the RCA Navy Defense E Flag Award uh, from their World War II uh, production work, uh, focusing on the women of RCA. So I look forward to that. Uh, December, we're moving it up a, a week because the last Tuesday would be December 25th. And that would be a problem. So we, we're making it December 18th, and local author historian, historian Derek Ritchie will return to show moral photos from the 19, uh, late 1950s and early 60s that we have scanned from the uh, archives of the Bloomington Herald Telephone. He's shown these before, and it's, it's really fun to look at. Uh, January 15th, 2019. Again, we're moving a, a, a date around. We're adding a, a program that month. Uh, Local historian and frequent contributor Clay Stuckey uh, will give what we call an intercession program, since that's a that's a month with five Tuesdays, so we can work one in the middle. We did it once before. Uh, this is called the Trials and Tribulations of the Corpse of a Abraham Lincoln. So, I've seen it a couple of times. Clay has given us all over the state and even out of state, and it's, it's a fascinating program. Uh, our regular program then on January 29th. Uh, 2019, IU history professor emeritus Jim Madison will give a program on the bicentennial of Monroe County. Uh, February 26, 2019, Carrie Beam, director of the Wiley House Museum, gives a program about the Wiley House and what an important place it occupies in the history of Monroe County. Uh, March 26, our own George Carpenter is going to reprise something he, he did a long time ago, and it's a a program on the Monon Railroad, and uh, believe me, he's the expert on it around here. Uh, as George mentioned earlier, April 30th, 2019, Michael White of Cats TV uh, will give a program on the history of cats and the many, many ways it serves our county. May 28th, local historian and author Dr. James Capshew will give a program on the life of Herman B. Wells. He's written a book about it, and he's the expert on Mr. Wells, Dr. Wells. June 25th, Brad Cook of IU Photo Archives will return for probably the fifth time at least uh, to show more vintage local photos from his huge collection. Uh, July 30th, 2019, Christine Friesel of the Monroe County Public <coughs> Library, who's been here many times, uh, she's discovered some more information on the local Underground Railroad, and she's gonna share that with us. August 28th is open. We'll put something in there, but we haven't come up with anything yet. Uh, September 25th, 2019. This is the bicentennial month of the First Presbyterian Church, and historian Owen Johnson will give a uh, history of it. He's the guy that gave the Ernie Pyle one just last month. Uh, today, we have John Summerlock. Uh, John is Director of Veterans Support Services at IU and also serves as Coordinator of Golden Book. Uh, he currently serves as co-chair of the Alexander Memorial Restoration Committee. He's an education historian by training and a public historian by passion. Uh, th this is, of course, about the Alexander Memorial, and probably a lot of us that grew up here remember looking up at that big monument on the, the courthouse lawn when we were young kids, wondering what the heck it is. Uh, I still don't know a lot about it, but I will after today, I think. So... Uh, uh, Without further ado, uh, here we go with John. Thank you. Uh, oops, let me turn it off. Turn it back on. All right, can you hear me? Nope. Try one more time. There we go. All right. 
so yeah, uh, uh, as I said in the introduction, uh, I'm the director of Veteran Support Services uh, on the IU campus. I work with our student veterans and military dependents, children, spouses uh, that are coming to IU using GI Bill benefits and, and all of those things. And I will be technically with that title and in that role uh, until Friday. Uh, and come Monday, uh, I'm very pleased to announce, I will become the director of the Center for Veteran and Military Students uh, on the Indiana University campus. We are creating a center uh, to provide support to our military and veteran students uh, beyond the kind of office that does the paperwork processing that we do now. We're expanding our services and, and creating a, uh, additional opportunities to recruit and retain uh, veterans and military students on our campus uh, through doing that. So uh, I'm excited to be moving from a 512 square foot office to a 1600 square foot center uh, we've already filled it and run out of office space, um, so we're hoping a couple years down the road to expand again, and we'll see where that goes with it. So, uh, so a little bit about uh, the Alexander Memorial Committee uh, before I, I get started with this. Uh, there, there's been talk of uh, working on restoring, doing work with the Alexander Memorial uh, for quite some time now. Um, uh, Cheryl, I mean, the DAR has been talking about this for how long? about 15 years that the DAR has been talking about it. Uh, and then as part of the bicentennial of the county, it came up again that there's some work that needs to be done uh, on it. And then the question became, well, okay, so we know it's called the Alexander Memorial, but like, what else do we know about it? Uh, and that put together a group of folks that said, well, let's do some research. Let's find out, let's see what we can learn about the Alexander Memorial. Uh, and in that process, uh, I do a lot of the military history for the Indiana University. Uh, if you've ever seen the Golden Book, uh, which is part of the Indiana Memorial Union, or you've been to the website, goldenbook.iu.edu, that's a project that I chair. That's our military history of the university. And I, through that, I know Mary Elfman, who's our county veteran services officer, and she said, hey, I know that you don't mind standing up in front of people and talking, and I don't like to do that, so I need a co-chair I'm nominating you, you're voluntold. Uh, and so that's how I wound up here, uh, which isn't entirely uh, uh, foreign to me. I do a lot of history presentations, particularly around campus, uh, usually on IU's military history, uh, IU in the Civil War, IU in World War I, a lot of that sort of work. Uh, I've done them in Indianapolis at the History Center up there and other places uh, as well. And so. I also, hopefully, uh, as part of the IU Bicentennial, you'll see a book coming out on IU's military history uh, that I'm in the process we're editing right now and, and should come out with that. Um, so I'm looking forward to at least 75, 80 copies being sold. Uh, so let's go with that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the Alexander Memorial. And in talking about it, we need to talk about, start with the very first part, which is Alexander himself. Um, so for those of y'all that, that for whatever reason, are not familiar with the Alexander Memorial. Uh, it stands on the southeast corner uh, of the Courthouse Square, and, and it is the oldest and first monument uh, that was built on the Courthouse Square after the courthouse itself. Uh, it was originally built uh, in 1928, and we'll kind of talk about that and, and where all that came from uh, and why. Uh, but to really kind of understand it, we have to understand why it's called the Alexander Memorial. And so there was a gentleman uh, named Williamson Martin Alexander, and as much as we all, the records always show him as being Williamson Alexander, uh, he was best known as Martin. Uh, there were several Williamson Alexanders and William Alexanders in the community, Alexander family being one of the founding families uh, of the area. Uh, and so he was, he, he was generally known as Martin. He was born in 1836 um, here in Bloomington. And his father was uh, John Alexander, uh, his mother was Margaret. They are buried in Dunn Cemetery on campus. They're part of the Alexander family, uh, direct founding descendants of the university and, and the community. Uh, his grandmother was Agnes Brewster, uh, the Brewster sisters, for those of, all, those of you all that aren't familiar with them, uh, are kind of the founding matriarchs of, of the university community. Uh, and so he's a part of that group. Uh, he was actually eligible to be buried there, but uh, he, he didn't for whatever reason. We don't really know a whole lot about his early life. Uh, there's some intermittent information that he at one point may have attended IU, uh, but it looks like it was probably in the preparatory school. 
Uh, so back in the 1800s, IU operated what we would think of today as a high school, a preparatory program for students from around the state uh, that needed to finish certain courses or programs to be able to get into the university. And a lot of local students would opt to be in the preparatory school as well. Uh, and so he may have attended that um, somewhere along the way. In his late teens and early 20s, uh, he actually left Bloomington and went to be a cattle rancher uh, and work on a cattle ranch in Minnesota. And I know immediately when I say cattle ranch, you think Minnesota. Uh, that's an obvious connection. <laughs> Uh, but apparently this was a big thing on the Minnesota-Iowa border around that time, uh, and, and he worked in that area quite a bit. And one of the things I find really fascinating about him uh, is for somebody born in Bloomington uh, in 1836, he really did an amazing amount of traveling uh, throughout his life. Uh, and all of it was done roughly by the time he was 30 years old. And so uh, we start off, we talk about the fact that I, we have no idea why or what connected him to go up there and start cattle farming, cattle ranching, being a cowboy uh, up in that area. But he went and did that. Uh, and then he returned and he decided to take up blacksmithing. Uh, and when he took up blacksmithing, he studied under the Sewards, who were his cousins. Uh, if you're familiar with the Sewards, the fish on the courthouse and, and all of that, um, that he studied under them and decided he was going to be a blacksmith. And then the Civil War started. Uh, and when the Civil War started, he enlisted in Company H of the 18th Indiana Volunteers. And, and it was kind of interesting because he enlisted as a sergeant. Um, so whoever was recruiting the company had already seen his maturity. They already understood some things about him that they said, we want to make you a sergeant from the very get-go. Uh, and he started out that way. He got assigned to the Western <coughs> Theater. And he started out, and first place he got was to Missouri, and as soon as he got to Missouri, he got promoted to being first sergeant. Um, so again, this is, you know, clearly, quickly, he's picking up these leadership roles as he's going. Um, shortly after that, he was involved in the Battle of Pea Ridge, uh, which, if you're not a Civil War historian, is probably not one of the battles you've heard a lot about, because it happened in a really obscure place in the northwestern corner of Arkansas, um, which was barely settled land at that point. Uh, and so he was involved in that. Uh, and then he traveled further on down the Mississippi uh, and was at the Battle of Port Gibson and the Siege of Vicksburg, uh, all in the Western Theater. So, you know, he's throughout his life, he's making his way up and down the Mississippi River. The Iowa-Minnesota connection is also a part of the, the Mississippi River piece. Um, after that, he got assigned to the Texas blockade, and he made his way all the way down to this little bitty town called Indianola, Texas. I had to Google that. I have no idea where that is. So, uh, but Indianola, Texas is, is about halfway down the Texas coast. Uh, it's a little bitty port town down there. Uh, and he spent several months uh, on the blockade down there, preventing Confederates from being able to, to land forces uh, there, resupplies there. Uh, which then in turn caused his enlistment to run out. And so he decided to re-enlist, uh, and he re-enlisted down there after a 30-day furlough. When he re-enlisted, they said, you can have 30 days off. And in that 30 days off, he made his way back to Bloomington, uh, and they told him, they said, when, you, when your 30 days are up, we need you to go to New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, don't go back to Indianola, go to New Orleans. So he went there, and by the time he made it to New Orleans, uh, they had decided that he was showing enough leadership to move him from being a first sergeant to being a lieutenant. So now if you know anything about how the military works today, there's like a big jump between being enlisted and officer, uh, and there, there's you know a different set of expectations that go with it. And that was sort of true back then. It wasn't entirely unusual for a senior NCO to, to become an officer. Uh, but in this case, he became an officer, and, and the first thing they did is they said, great, we're going to ship your unit to the Shenandoah Valley. So they boarded ships in New Orleans, they traveled all the way up and around to Washington, D.C., and they marched out to the Shenandoah Valley, and they served in the Shenandoah Valley campaign uh, in 1864. Uh, around this time, in early 1865, he got promoted to being a captain, uh, and that's where he would stay for the rest of his life. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but, uh, you know, there was, he was really, really proud, and it really meant a lot to him to have made it to captain and to be a commander of a unit. Uh, and so when the war ended, uh, they were still in Virginia in that area, and he actually got assigned uh, to provost duty, law enforcement duty, uh, in southern Georgia uh, to help with the reconstruction efforts and things that were going on down there. Uh, and he made his way to southern Georgia until August 28th of 1865, where he was finally discharged. 
Over the course of the Civil War and all of his travels, he spent four years and 12 days in, in the Army on active service. And so even during the Civil War, that's quite a long period of continuous service to, to have been a part of it. And so you can kind of explain a little bit about why he was able to, to climb through a lot of those ranks. Uh, so when he decided to return back to Bloomington, uh, he decided, I got to figure out what I want to do with my life uh, because I'm not going to be able to, to keep doing the Army thing. And the blacksmith thing was sort of working, uh, but he got this idea that maybe from his cattle ranching days, I'm not entirely sure, he wanted to open a meat market. Uh, and he was going to be a butcher. And so he opened a butcher shop uh, that was on the corner, uh, near the corner of uh, uh, Walnut and 6th Street, um, a little beyond where the Princess Theater uh, is located at. Mm -hmm. He had a, a small butcher shop that was there. Uh, but not content with doing all that, he decided to become a deputy sheriff as well. And so he became a deputy sheriff. And in 1876, he was elected to be sheriff of Monroe County. Uh, and so when we were doing this, we started doing this presentation, we started doing this work, we really played that piece up uh, until Brad Swain, our current sheriff, felt that he needed to donate to the memorial fund uh, and the restoration fund. So that's why we do the research we do, right? So we can put the pressure on folks. <laughs> After being sheriff uh, for a four-year stint, um, he stepped back from public life a little bit, uh, remained as a blacksmith and a butcher, uh, and in 1882, he decided to run for office again, and he became the county auditor. Uh, and so if there's anybody in here from the county auditor's office, we're still waiting on your check. Uh, please feel free. He was also one of the charter members of the Knights of Pythias, uh, and, and their facility is still standing uh, downtown, uh, and was a piece of that. He rose to high ranks in the organization. He was an active member of the GAR, uh, the Grand Army of the Republic, which was the veterans organization uh, for the Union Army. Uh, and at the time that he died, he was one of only four surviving members of the GAR uh, that were left in the county. Uh, and so, and he was very proud of, of that work. Uh, I'll also add, he was close friends with his cousin. Um, he had a cousin, John Alexander, uh, who was an IU alum, and he donated, uh, John was actually the state commander for the GAR. And during John's time as state commander, he had saved just books and books and books of these clippings and things about the GAR and everything else. And those have been donated back to the university. We have them in the university archives. And so it was kind of neat to sit back and look at these, you know, early 1920s, all these clippings of what all these veterans organizations were doing and involved in at the time and, and how much uh, they were involved. It also happens that Williamson uh, left a pretty good paper trail. Uh, we have a large collection, well, a, a notable collection of his uh, paperwork that is held by the Mon uh, Monroe County Library. Uh, it includes some of his papers and his enlistment papers, uh, his will, and, and some of those materials. This is actually his enlistment uh, from Indianola, Texas, um, which was how I found the name of Indianola and managed to look it up. Uh, and so we were able to do that. Now, in his personal life, uh, along the way, uh, he did get married, uh, married a woman named Maka Jenny Birch. Uh, she went by Jenny, and they had a child, uh, but both the, uh, Jenny and the child uh, died fairly young. Uh, daughter was about 11 when she died, and his wife died just a year after their marriage. Uh, and so about 12 years later, he decided to marry again, and he married a woman named Eliza Jane Hoover. Now, this is a fascinating relationship to me, and, and I can't pretend in any way that I have all the details, but it looks a little, <laughs> Cheryl's laughing, it's a little bit reality show-like when you kind of dig into this, right? Like, this is not, so when you think about the 1880s, this isn't really what you think of when you think of this. So they got married. Uh, there was clearly some issues uh, that were there, but it's also very clear that he really liked her, her son from a previous marriage and his wife, and he kind of adopted his stepson and his daughter-in-law as his own kids, uh, and that part is very clear. Uh, however, I'm not sure that Eliza actually liked her son uh, or his wife or anything else. And there's long periods where she just kind of disappears from the history record in the books and she comes back and they're married, but then they're sort of not, they're clearly not living together. And then at one point there's a divorce and apparently he gets his stepson in the divorce. His stepson's like 
35 and married at this point, right? But he gets the stepson. And, and by that, I mean he literally lives with them, and they treat him as their father, and, and he helps take care of them, and, and it's a, a family arrangement. And Eliza just kind of disappears off the record in, in a lot of ways. Maybe she went cattle ranching in Minnesota. Um, we don't know. But uh, it, it makes her some interesting sleuthing, and we're, we're always kind of trying to figure out what happened there. Uh, in his later years, uh, Williamson was actually taken care of uh, by the Hoovers, uh, by his stepson and, and their wife, uh, and his wife, uh, and their child, uh, who had what I think is one of the cooler names I've run across in, in my research, their son was Philpott Hoover, uh, that's P-H-I-L-P-U-T, Philpott. Uh, he actually became an IU student, and, and Williamson treated him as his grandson and, and was very excited about the fact that he became an IU student. Uh, and then he died of tuberculosis his freshman year. So as an IU person, you know, we, we kind of struggle with our students and these sort of things happening. Uh, when I read back in history and I hear about things like how the university dealt with these things, you know, 100 years ago, uh, you know, I see those connections to what my predecessors were doing uh, in those processes. Um, and Philpott's obituary is by far one of the best obituaries that, that you can read uh, in, in the newspapers and everything else. Uh, Philpott was on his deathbed for days uh, and was not conscious, not answering. And then according to the obituary that was published in the paper, uh, about an hour before his death, he sat up, began talking, carrying on very lucid conversations with folks, very aware of what was happening, started telling them what he had been doing for the last four or five days and, and how he had kind of had this uh, uh, out-of-body experience and had talked to, to people that had passed away a long time before and everybody's okay and when he dies, this is how he wants the funeral to go and this is who he wants to be as pallbearers and that he's going to die in the next few minutes and then sure enough, he does. And if you read the list of all the people who attended, it is a, this is 1921 or so, it is a who's who, or 1911, 1912, uh, it is a who's who of university and Monroe County officials and leadership and folks. It kind of gives you an idea of where uh, Alexander, Williamson Alexander and the Hoover family kind of were seen at that point uh, of who it was. Um, but so having lacked a, a spouse, uh, only having the, these two children uh, that he had sort of adopted and then not having a grandson or any grandchildren kind of left Alexander at a point where he had a fair amount of money uh, by the standards of the time. Uh, so he, he had had this career, he had done a number of things, uh, and so the time came to decide what he was going to do with his money uh, when he died. Uh, when he died, he left $500 for erecting a monument on his grave at Rose Hill, uh, and this is that monument. Uh, he left some money and property to some of the family, particularly the Hoovers. Uh, and, and one of my personal favorites here, uh, Phil Put had a, they say fiance, um, I, I, I don't see a lot of information about what their engagement was like, but he had a woman that he was in a relationship with that was his fiance. Uh, and, and Alexander felt so connected to her that he made sure to leave money to her when he died. So this would have been his, his granddaughter uh, had Phil put live longer. And so then in his uh, will, he says, I will and direct that my executor cause to be erected a monument to be known and marked as the Alexander Memorial Monument erected in honor of and to the memory of all soldiers and sailors of any and all wars who have gone into the service of their country from Monroe County, Indiana. I prefer that this monument be erected on the south side of the courthouse lawn near the south entrance thereto, if satisfactory arrangements can be made with the Board of Commissioners of Monroe County. And I ask that the Board of Commissioners of Monroe County be asked to donate whatever sum they may see fit to fund of the, for the erection of said monument. And I further request that all soldiers of all wars, together with their friends of such soldiers, be asked to contribute to such fund. And so this was part of his will that he wanted to leave the money to, to build this monument. So in the 1920s, 
Uh, if you look across the country and, and where things were at, you know, the early 1900s, we had seen things like the Soldiers and Sailors Monument in downtown Indianapolis. We had our first Civil War uh, monument built here in the county. Uh, but by the time World War I is over, the idea that we also need to include the World War I veterans and the World War I soldiers becomes a piece of this. And so shortly thereafter, you get the university running the Memorial Fund to build Memorial Hall and the Memorial Union and Memorial Stadium. Uh, this becomes a, a piece of that, that monument mania uh, that was sort of occurring at that point. Uh, but he really wants to make it exclusive to the folks in Monroe County. So on June 9th, 1928, uh, it was dedicated on the southwest corner of the courthouse, uh, almost across the street from the, from the Knights of Pythias, I'll get there, Hall, which was built in 1907. Uh, and so the uh, KP is... And th this is one of my favorite pictures uh, because I actually tried to recreate this picture. I like to think of myself as a, an amateur photographer. Uh, and, and I thought, yeah, I want to recreate this picture, the same angle, the same look. And I really want to get like the, the, the rows of cars particularly, right? So that we have like modern cars in the same picture. You actually can't take this picture anymore. Uh, there's too many trees. There's too many things. Like you, there, part of the monument from this angle is a little bit blocked. Um, it just doesn't quite work. And so in some ways, this is kind of a, a very time capsule photo of, of what it looked like at that point. It was the first monument uh, on the courthouse. And so you'll notice also right behind it, you can see a little bit of the, the there's two Civil War cannons uh, that were back there as well uh, that were placed there around that time. Uh, we didn't have the, the Vietnam uh, Memorial Monument. We didn't have uh, the, the drinking fountain. We didn't have uh, even our newest ones the, to women in government and some of the other monuments that were there uh, at that point. And so this was really kind of a new thing. We have one person uh, who is still alive who attended the dedication ceremony. Uh, and he actually lives in uh, North Carolina or Virginia. I don't remember. Do you remember? Sure. Yeah. Uh, he grew up here in Bloomington. He was nine years old uh, when the, the ceremony took place. And so he is uh, aging up on 100 uh, now. Uh, and he, some of his friends said, you know, hey, they're doing this restoration thing. And he's like, well, I remember being there the day it happened. Uh, and so we're in the process of trying to connect with him a little bit to get a little bit of information about what that day was like and kind of what activities and things went on. Uh, but at the point that it was, it was dedicated, it, it was quite the thing. Uh, George W. Bunting Jr. was the architect. Uh, George W. Bunting Sr. And the, the, is responsible for the original four buildings uh, of the IU Dunwoods campus. Uh, and so our, our four oldest buildings we have now are, are part of that. Uh, this was his son that designed the monument. Uh, Joseph Graff and George McIlvane uh, were the carvers. And so there, there's a lot of carving that went on with it. Uh, the quarries were very involved with it. Uh, the interesting thing is that despite its prominent location, there are not a lot of close-up photos of it uh, from, from about 1928 through about 1993. And we'll talk a little bit about why that comes into play here in a second. Uh, but one of our challenges is finding, and I was, I've had a couple conversations with folks before we got started, the reason we go out and do these presentations and talk to the community is because we're waiting on that person that comes in and says, hey, in my attic, look what I found, right? Or, you know, I was looking through my grandmother's scrapbook from when she graduated high school, and I found this photo. Uh, we have the photo, pop, we have pictures of it in the background popping up all over the place. Uh, I was randomly on social media about a year or so ago, uh, and the Lilly Library was posting photos uh, from the Breaking Away film uh, that were taken, still shots of it. And there's a photo of the Alexander Memorial. He's standing in front of it with his bike, right? It's like one of the iconic like, you know, photos from the movies that they took, uh, but it's the side that we have all the photos of. It's not the other sides. Uh, but so we're, we're always watching, waiting for those photos to pop up uh, that show us more about it. And so part of the reason that, that we're looking at that uh, is that over the years, oh, there's a KP. Over the years, uh, it has weathered quite a bit. Uh, this is a, a little truer to color photograph, although it's, it's, you can see some of the weathering and the, and the gray that's on it. Uh, 
Uh, and this is the front of it, and it is not my, my camera is not what's creating that discoloring. Um, that is actual discoloring that, that is on it. You can see there's a, around the gar uh, up at the top, there's some, some pock marks uh, and some discoloring. And you'll notice that the panel itself is kind of a light tan, uh, and the rest of the monument is kind of this dark gray. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why that is. Um, and then the three side panels uh, are pretty rough shape. So the question that we are kind of struggling with and we're researching is why are the panels in rough shape? Uh, now there's probably, most of y'all have at one point or another probably heard one of two stories if you've heard about how the panels got to be this way. Uh, so story number one that I hear most often and, and is most prominent and is actually uh, recorded in the Smithsonian's uh, documentation of the monument uh, is that in the early 80s or mid 80s, uh, somebody came up with this idea that they needed to clean the monument and in the process of cleaning it, they used a, a acid chemical uh, which doesn't do well on limestone and, and that was the cause of, of what happened. And, and there's a, that, that may well have very well happened, that may have been trying to prevent further damage, uh, it may not have been the cause of the damage. The other story that exists in the community uh, and I've heard this from several different places. Uh, in And I've got the date written down on my desk, and I can't remember, it's 68. Um, in 68, there was a really large protest against the draft. Uh, and local folks, including a number of IU students, uh, marched on the courthouse and, and literally laid siege to the courthouse for the night. Uh, and this is the part that you know, brings the sheriff back in. Uh, the, the sheriff actually had to spend the night inside of the courthouse uh, to defend the courthouse from, from being broken into and, and attacked during that time. And then shortly thereafter, the next day, as the reporters are taking pictures, uh, they noticed that the monument had been defaced at some point uh, during the night and that this had occurred. Uh, there, there's a story, we've not found the newspaper, maybe it wasn't a newspaper, we're not sure, but that there were side-by-side -side before and after photos that were published uh, of the damage that, that happened. Uh, and so if anybody finds that, beer's on me. Uh, I'm more than happy to, or beverage of your choice uh, is on me. I'm more than happy to celebrate with anybody that's able to find that. Uh, but as you can see, there's a combination of, of pockmarks and scarring, uh, which is the, the lines which go across the monument. Uh, and so the top right panel is dedicated to the Spanish-American War, uh, 1898 to 1902. The middle panel, which is almost barely unreadable, uh, is from the World War, uh, which at that point was World War I. Uh, and then the top, the left one, is from the Mexican War uh, in 1847. And so these were panels were dedicated specifically to them. And we have some idea of what these panels look like. There's a little bit of enough information there that we can sort of still make out what the carvings were. And, and we think we're going to be able to get those reproduced um, fairly easily. We have some photos where we can see those. The challenge is what we call the corners uh, or the rounds. Uh, and so each corner of the monument has a 3D sort of relief sculpture uh, that is a piece of it depicting various scenes. Uh, and, and this gives you a little bit of an idea of what those are. Uh, the far one on the left over here is uh, soldiers. There's a, this is a Civil War scene. The soldiers are marching forward. There's wounded soldiers laying on the ground, uh, and there's a, a flag uh, up above them. Uh, this next one is a home front scene uh, during presumably the Civil War. Um, and, and there's a family with some small kids and a, a tree, and you can really see the, the pock marking uh, as it's occurred there. Uh, and I'm going to jump over here. This is the one we call the cavalry charge, uh, because what we think is that this is somebody riding a horse. If you look at it really close, you can sort of see the horse and the person on it. Uh, but we really don't know a whole lot about this one. Um, this is my personally favorite one because it's the most historically inaccurate of anything um, that could be there. This is Abraham Lincoln uh, standing on the battle battlefield holding a flag with a sailor and a soldier next to him. Um, so never would have happened, but it makes for a great monument. Uh, I, I love this one. Uh, and there's, like a, there's, a, there's a drummer off to the side over here uh, as well. Uh, and so when you look at these up close, you can tell. So you can see the, the damage at the bottom of each of them. You can see the discoloring 
uh, where it gets lighter around each of them. Uh, and this is, this is part of the damage or, or the defacing that occurred of it. Uh, whether it was intentional or not, our committee you know, is less concerned with. If we know a little bit about how it happened, then we know a little bit about how we can sort of prevent it in the future uh, and whatnot. But for a 90-year-old monument, um, this shouldn't be the level of limestone damage that we're seeing. Uh, and, and given that it is only on these panels that are accessible at ground level, we know it's not part of a larger thing. Um, so we called a company in uh, to do some structural assessment and, and do some photographing and documentation of it. Uh, as you work your way up, uh, they brought in a lift to get up there and look at these photos. You can see that uh, the discoloring is there, but the actual defacement and damage is not there. So this is 1861, 1898. These dates match the dates of the wars that are below them. Uh, and up around the crown, you can still see the U.S. shields, uh, which are Civil War uh, mm -hmm. iconography. And, and for the guy on top, I like to call him Martin because I, I like to think that this is uh, Williamson. Uh, he's still in fairly good shape, but he's he's 90. Um, you know, he's he's got some some stuff going on. Uh, he's got a. You can tell from the birds over the years. He's uh, built up a little bit of uh, of uh, uh, build up there. <laughs> you you can call it what you want. I'm gonna call it build up. Uh, He's in fairly good shape. Uh, you know, you can still see this is his bayonet, uh, which is a fairly thin piece of, uh, of stone, uh, is still in fairly good shape. Uh, his rifle is still in fairly good shape. And some things that today we wouldn't do with a monument, uh, so if you look right down at his feet, there's actually behind his, where his rifle comes down, there's almost an area that would make like a little puddle back there. And you certainly wouldn't do that with a monument today because that's going to create all sorts of problems. It's actually held up really well um, it, over the 90 years uh, of doing it. Uh, he's got his backpack on uh, and he's got his canteen that hangs off the back back here. Uh, and so really he, he's doing okay. He has one ear uh, that's got a little, little bit of ear worn off. Uh, and he's got the other here has a small hole in it, uh, and we're trying to start a rumor that he had a pierced ear. Uh, it's not really catching on, but y'all can help me with that. So what do you do when you want to restore a monument? Uh, and so part of the work that we're doing uh, is setting a precedent for how do we restore monuments in the county? Uh, the county owns a number of monuments. How do we take care of them? How do we maintain them? How do we do that? Uh, up until a couple of years ago, there, there really wasn't a plan for taking care of monuments. I mean, as the normal sort of maintenance of we'll mow the grass and we'll spray them off every once in a while, sure. Uh, but the idea of cleaning them, repairing, maintaining, that wasn't really in the budget anywhere that anybody was doing. And so what we're developing with the Community Foundation is a plan for how do we fund and kind of keep these monument restorations going as we need to do them. Somebody brought up the drinking fountain uh, on, the, on the square. Uh, that's, a, that's a monument to clean water uh, in, in a way here that we had to shut off because it didn't have clean water in it anymore. Uh, and so, you know, what's the chances we could restore that and turn it back into being a fountain at least, if not a drinking fountain? You know, those are the sort of questions we're asking about how do we maintain the monuments. Now, this is one of those, you know, Indiana University is, has got plenty of monuments and things on campus, and, and we're using their experts and their folks to do it, but it's also a matter of money. Uh, in order to do that. The assessment alone uh, for the, the, the monument costs us almost $20,000 just to have an engineering firm come in and do a full structural assessment and look and see what it would cost. And the county paid that. The county uh, put up the money for that. And so this is some of that assessment going on. Um, as you can see, we did have to drill holes in the monument, uh, and, and they have repaired those fairly well. Um, you probably won't really notice them unless you're looking for them. Uh, but it was already so badly damaged that this became the easiest way. And we, we don't have a lot of information about how it was constructed, so one of our challenges was if we take this panel off, does the whole thing fall down? Like, we literally don't know how it was put together. Is everything just stacked on top of each other or is something holding it on the inside? Uh, and so in order to answer some of those questions, we drilled some holes around it and we stuck some little cameras inside of it to try and figure that out. Uh, and then we were able to determine that we could probably take a panel off to look inside of it and, and be okay. Uh, so we did. Uh, and so 
This is our engineers. They got a chance to get inside of there. They are not any further in there because just the other side of where they're at, uh, there's another giant stone inside of there that all of the, the upper part of the panel sits on. Uh, and so that's why we're able to take one of the side panels off. There is a structural stone in the middle that literally takes up the whole middle. Um, so there's not like there's work on the inside that you can you know, look around and see what's happening. Uh, but we were able to do a, a fair amount of documentation and, and looking at what was happening from there. Uh, and so uh, along the way, we now know that we're probably looking, uh, including that initial structural assessment, we're probably looking at about a $200,000 project uh, in order to, to replace the panels that need to be replaced. Now, the upside of that is limestone companies have already jumped on board and said, hey, we'll donate the stone. Okay, great. Now all we got to do is pay carvers, and we got to move stone. Okay, I, I, I'm a historian. I work with veterans. I did not know what it costs to move stone. Um, it's expensive. Uh, let's just say that. Uh, you know, I come from a world of like we'll find five young Marines to pick it up, and we'll put it on a truck, and it'll be fine. Uh, this apparently is heavier than that. So uh, we've got to do some of that work. We have to find the right colors of stone. We have to find the right carvers that can do the work. And they, we found carvers that are willing to, to offer us discounts and are willing to you know, work with us on it. Uh, but in the process of doing that, they said, there's not really enough for us to go off of here. We need, like the cavalry charge, for, for instance. We need somebody to kind of mock up what that's supposed to look like. Like, we're really good at copying things, but we need an actual artist to do kind of the initial uh, work on it. And so we've been working on sculptor artists in the local community that are willing to, to partner with us to recreate some of those pieces so that the, the carvers will be able to, to create those. Uh, and in the end, we, we think we're going to get there, uh, but we're still a little bit short. Uh, right now, we're probably still uh, in the $100,000 to $120,000 range uh, of, of what our costs are going to be uh, and the efforts that, that we'll need to figure out. Uh, we're working with various grants, various local entities, um, local corporations and groups that are interested in, in helping out with it. Um, we actually started the fund uh, with a, a generous combination donation from the VFW, uh, the American Legion, and AMBETS. They pledged together to, get them, to donate $5,000 to get the account opened uh, with a community foundation so that we would be able to uh, start that. And then we've had other donations along the way. One of our one of our larger awareness projects that we've been doing to try and get the word out. Now, we're not going to be able to restore the whole monument off of this, but one of our larger awareness projects we've been doing, some of you all may have seen the Monroe County Coloring Book. Um, these are $15. We sell them at a lot of bicentennial and community events. Um, that money goes towards uh, uh, our restoration efforts. For those that are familiar with military challenge coins, uh, I didn't bring any of them with me today, but we do have a Alexander Memorial challenge coin uh, as well that we've been selling as, as part of this to kind of raise the awareness uh, and help people with it. Now, when we did these uh, coloring books, as you look through, you'll see a lot of uh, uh, donors were able to choose what they wanted to have in the coloring book. So, for instance, uh, my office on campus, we sponsored uh, the Golden Book Room, the memorial room in the Union. And so an artist came in and did a, a drawing of that that's in the coloring book, and then you get your name down here below it. Uh, and so we went to a lot of local businesses. You'll see some interesting places in here, even a few that technically no longer exist uh, that you'll see in here as well. <coughs> Uh, that are a, a part of this, uh, all donated, uh, all funded through uh, donors. So it didn't cost us anything to do the artwork and, and put this together in the first place. And I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you I brought extras in case you want to buy one. Cheryl will help you out afterwards. So, yep. Uh, and so this is the, the drawing of the Alexander Memorial uh, that's in there uh, that's a part of it as well. And so that's kind of where we're at on the restoration project. We, we don't necessarily have a hard timeline uh, because we're still working on that funding piece. We've reached out to some of the larger uh, foundations and things in the state of Indiana, and those processes take months and months to, to look at getting the money. Uh, we've also worked with some of our local community folks, and so we're hopeful that we'll be able to get there eventually. Uh, 
what, in my mind, uh, as a veteran, uh, I, I've served 16 years uh, in the military, uh, and, and in my mind, as a veteran, you know, one of the challenges here is that, that Williamson had this idea that this was going to be his legacy with no children, no grandchildren. Uh, you know, this really was his commitment to his fellow soldiers, to, to those in the GAR. And, and he would have been alive to see the founding of the American Legion and, and the early chapters and those sort of things in the community. Uh, and this really, he did see as a legacy to the, all the soldiers and sailors of Monroe County. Uh, and, and part of a, my job is to kind of keep that going uh, and make sure that 90 years from now, we still have this monument uh, that's there to look to. Uh, and hopefully someday uh, we stop putting monuments around the courthouse uh, to the wars and things that we have to do. Um, but in the meantime, we'll always have this one, which is dedicated to the sons and daughters of all wars uh, from Monroe County. So at this point, I'll, I'll turn it over. If you've got questions or things that you want to know more about in the process, Clay. Do I assume correctly that uh, the, the four corners and the four plaques mm -hmm. are going to be duplicated and reinstalled, and, and new ones installed? Yes. And above that, pretty much, you're just going to uh, touch up things, or is something getting replaced above it? Right now, we're planning to just touch up and clean up uh, the stuff that's above it. Uh, there may be a point 30 years from now where we may want to look at replacing the, the soldier on the top or recarving the soldier on the top if that deterioration sort of continues. Um, but part of our challenge in just replacing them is we've got to look at things like the cavalry charge and without that's actually one of them that we don't have a picture. That's the one we don't have a picture of, right? Uh, we don't have a picture of the corner that has the cavalry charge on it. So we have no idea what that originally looked like. Uh, Right. So we have no idea. And, that was totally yeah, and so on this one, we know it says Mexican War. We know it has the date. We know from the other ones that there, there's some trim around the edge, but we don't know if there was anything in the middle or not. Okay. Uh, and so those photographs are really one of the big things that, that we're looking for uh, so that we can try and be as historically accurate as possible uh, in recreating these. Otherwise, in the meantime, what we'll have to do is an artist's interpretation of what this cavalry charge looked like. And, and another question, has anybody been at all critical of the quality of the stone in the original monument? <laughs> the Indiana Limestone Institute? That's their, oh, for sure. yeah. That's their name, right? That's, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, make sure I got their name right. Um, which has been a big partner of ours. Uh, and they have sent their limestone experts out to look at it and determine if it was bad stone, if there were stone issues or any of that. Uh, and what we have found, let me go back to, see if I can find an example here. Actually, at the very beginning, there's a photo. So if you look at this photo, uh, th this right here, which is a, a base piece, uh, is pretty much the exact same stone out of the same quarry as the other stuff. But because it doesn't display that same pocking, those same issues, that's part of what clues us in that something happened to it to create this, uh, and that the stone itself probably isn't the problem. Um, you can also tell in a couple of these pictures, you know, like right here, you can see that, like, this is all one piece of stone, but only this chunk right here is defaced and damaged from whatever dripped down or came off of that. Uh, and so that, that clues us in a little bit that it wasn't just a stone problem. Uh, although what, what we're a little worried about, the guy on the top uh, has been pretty weather beaten. Uh, and, and that's the one that, that maybe we need a little tougher stone up there. So, yes, sir. Do you anything to preserve this now before you get anything farther along? I've, I've been up there on Sunday morning going to the bookstore across the street and have ran kids and their mothers away from the thing because they were climbing around pulling on the heads of the carpets. And I, on several occasions, have done that. And I get some incredulous looks from pissed off mothers. But I, I basically, the last time I did this, I told them that this was akin to a grave and they had their kids up there in face of somebody's grave. And they were even more afraid the last time I got <laughs> I can't I'll, imagine that, Phil. I'm, I'm also a, 
I'm also a conduct officer for the Dean of Students, uh, and, and I, I also got handed the case of the student, the intoxicated student who was riding one of the Civil War cannons um, one evening. Uh, so <laughs> you can apparently do it when you're 19 as well. Uh, so uh, y yes and no. Um, you know, part of it is that we're we're hoping in the long run when we replace this stuff that we'll be able to maybe add some something to inform the community about what it is and why it's there as a piece of this. Uh, you know, kind of my, my dream is that we'll have a little thing off to the side that explains to people what it is and why. In the meantime, we have documented uh, time and time again from every angle everything that's there so that we have at least that part set in stone is what I was going to say. That's not what uh, we have. We have that part for our records. You know, that's a good dad joke right there. Are you planning to completely recarve these four panels? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we're going to replace those replace four them. panels. What will you do with the existing panels? Well, you know, if somebody came along and wanted to uh, uh, be a donor and wanted those, we would be more than happy to sell those to them. Uh, that, that really doesn't appeal to them. Okay. Uh, and I, I think that yes. it should, should be preserved we've, in another way under your control. Yeah, we, we've talked about that. Um, the corner panels we might be able to do something with, um, maybe in conjunction with the History Center or something like that. Uh, the large panels are, are in the tons of what they weigh. Um, and, and if we do something with those, it's going to be a one-time thing. We're going to put them here, and then they'll probably never be moved again. This is a stone town. They can manage it. I'm yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So. Is, is there going to be some preservation techniques used on whatever is redone to preserve it from the weather? I know there's been a big issue with acid rain and stuff mm -hmm. on limestone. Yep. Uh, something to seal the stone and preserve it. Yeah, so we're working with some contractors out of Indianapolis. The engineering company that we hired uh, has done most of the memorials and the restorations around Indianapolis and a lot of those, and that's one of their areas that they, they do a lot of work with. And we've included that as kind of a, if we get everything completely restored, then we, we have enough money, then we're going to do some of this prevention work, some sort of seal or thing that we can, yeah. you know, put over it. Um, those wear off eventually and have to be redone. So again, as part of the money of we were going to do a regular maintenance schedule, then we'll be able to, to figure that out. Yeah, we downtown on the Mona Memorial, mm -hmm. uh, we had it covered with an anti-graffiti covering. Mm -hmm. And basically, if somebody comes along and spray paints that, mm -hmm. you come along with a hot water washer and wash it off, then you have to cover it again. Right. And it's not cheap, but yeah. it, saves, it saves the memorial. Yes, sir. I thought as a child, when you looked at the monument, there was a bayonet on the end of the rifle. Do any of your pictures show a bayonet back in the 20s and 30s? There's no bayonet now. No, well, he's got one that's... The no bayonet on the rifle. Yeah. Because we were told at the time that 68 mm -hmm. fiasco, they took the bayonet the off the rifle at the, at the First World War monument at Rose Hill. That had a bayonet yeah. on it. Yeah. Both of those were broken at that time. Some kid yeah. lined up there and knocked it off. Well, yeah. if, if he did, if there was one on there, so this is the tip of the rifle barrel, if there was one, it would be, yeah, it would be right at his face. Um, well, you'll be able to see that in that good picture you've got there. Yeah, I don't, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I've zoomed in on this quite a bit. No, it's um, there. That's and it's, yeah, that's I don't. It's a pretty high res picture if they yeah. ever had a bayonet on the rifle. Yeah. Yeah, this is where this is where the, the military accuracy piece of me comes in. That if he's got one hanging on his side, he shouldn't have one up here. But yeah, could be. Um, but no, I've not seen one. Well, so notice the statues. The soldier does have the bayonet. It's just unique that this one doesn't. Yeah. What? So. So one one of the things uh, I read a really good book uh, called Memorial Mania. Uh, if you're looking for a book about memorials, I, I really found this book um, uh, interesting. And if you're IU connected, you can actually download the entire book for free through the IU library. Um, you have to log in like three times to get all the chapters, but you can do it. Um, and so uh, one of the things they talk about is during this time period, uh, and they actually showed pictures of it in the book, this is an almost carbon copy of 
the, this company out of New York that was making these memorials uh, and selling them. Like you could go online, almost like the Sears and Roebuck catalog. You could you could go in and, and there's a memorial catalog, and you'd say, "We want this person right here, this soldier with these things, uh, you know, number 48B," and they would just ship it out to wherever it was that you wanted to put the memorial in. Uh, and, and as far as how he is depicted, he is very close to being that, but not quite enough. So I think what probably happened is our local carvers looked at that picture and said, eh, I can do this. And so it may be that that's where that, because I'm trying to think back now as to whether or not the bayonet was on the end of that in those, and, and that may be where that came from, and that was one of their variations that they did. Yeah? Do you know the exact date of that demonstration in 1968 that may have caused uh -huh. some of the damage? Yep, it's written on a post-it note on the right side of my keyboard <laughs> next to my computer. What, what, what's your email name? Okay. Because I wouldn't mind looking. Yeah, so. yeah, and we've kind of done a kind of cursory look back through there and not seen anything. Um, but we had, in the 60s, we had a lot of very short-lived newspaper efforts, and so whether which newspaper effort it was, it's hard to tell. So I'm kind of curious, though, in the South, it isn't so prevalent here, but there's been a lot of contentious relations with monuments mm -hmm. particular to the southern soldiers. Mm -hmm. Has anyone uh, been mincing around talking about our monuments yet? Well, and after all, we did win the war. We, we, <laughs> we do get asked pretty regularly uh, if it's a Confederate monument. Oh, uh, and, 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 well, and, he's looking south. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so that, that's... We, we were... Uh, we, we kind of we kind of joked about it, but we were really excited when we actually got these photos from the top. And you can see he's wearing a, a U.S. buckle, yeah. um, so he's 100% not a Confederate, uh, and we you know, we kind of assume that anyway. I will say that's more of an interesting question than you might think, though, uh, because uh, Bunting, who who did the first four buildings for IU, was a Confederate soldier, and this was his son that did the monument. Uh, and so they moved north after the war, and, and so, uh, you know, the idea that there's some hidden secret Confederate thing somewhere, um, you know, might still exist. Uh, as, as the military historian for campus, uh, I also recently uh, wrote, wrote an article uh, about, and it was then uh, actually got recorded on WFHB, uh, about our Confederate statue on campus. Uh, for those of y'all who don't know, we have a Confederate monument uh, on campus. Anybody surprised to know that? Those are, we have a, we have a Confederate. It, it was paid for by Confederate soldiers. It was sculpted uh, by Bell Kinney, who was the daughter of a Confederate officer. But most people know it as the Richard Owen statue uh, that is in the Indiana Memorial Union. Richard Owen was a Union commander uh, during the Civil War. And one of the jobs he was given was that he was uh, commander of the Camp Morton prison camp uh, up in Indianapolis. And the Confederate prisoners, it, when he ran the camp, he did these things that were considered completely radical at the time, like letting them have blankets in Indiana in the winter and making sure they had enough food. Uh, and he allowed the Confederate sergeants to be in charge of discipline in the camp. Uh, and these were radical ideas for a prison camp in the Civil War. Years later, these would become standard parts of the Geneva Convention for treatment of prisoners during wartime. Uh, but when Owen eventually got rotated out and was sent to the front and commanded troops during the war, uh, he wound up getting captured by the Confederates at one point. Uh, and the Confederates said, we've heard about how you treat our prisoners. We've heard about what you do. You can keep your own weapons, have your men turn theirs in, and you're all paroled. You can go back home. And so after the war, that gives you an idea of how much the folklore about Colonel Richard Owen kind of spread during the war. Uh, and so after the war, in the 1920s, uh, these Confederate prisoners uh, kind of pooled the money together and said, hey, we want a statue given to the state of Indiana to say thank you, because we wouldn't be alive in the 1920s if it wasn't for the way that he treated us when we were his prisoners. Uh, and they put the money together. The originals in the State House in Indianapolis uh, and IU and Purdue both have a copy of it. Owen was the first president of Purdue while it was being built. Uh, he was still a faculty member at IU, important thing to note. Uh, first president of Purdue was an IU faculty member the whole time he was president. Uh, 
Yeah, and he's a grandson of Robert Dale Owen and the New Harmony Project. The family's very involved in, in all that. Um, and so when they finally finished building the Purdue campus, Owen was like, that's great. I resign as president. Don't actually want to move to Lafayette. Uh, and so he stayed here. Uh -huh. Did you hear the, le the legend of victory on Monument Circle? That she faces self, that if the self ever does rise again, she will go first. There, there, uh, there, there is a disproportionate uh, number of northern memorials face south and southern memorials face north. I grew up in the south. I grew up in, in Alabama. Uh, my degrees are from Mississippi State. Uh, you know, I'm very aware of the war of northern aggression uh, and, and how that works. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, growing up in that culture, these are things that you notice uh, and, and kind of being aware of. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a common thing that, that happens with them. Yes, there is. Uh, so, Just the you. Question we wanted. <laughs> did, did we ask him to say that? No. Okay. No, no. I'm just I checking. Gave a fiver. Okay. All right. Uh, so yeah, if you're interested in donating money or you're interested in just kind of seeing pictures and learning more about the process, uh, we are using as a website a Facebook page that you don't have to be a Facebook member to see. You can just go to the Facebook page and see it. If you Google Alexander Memorial, uh, it'll generally pop up on most search engines. Um, and it's uh, Alexander Memorial MC, so facebook.com slash Alexander Memorial MC. And there's a link on there to uh, the Community Foundation's webpage, and you can make a donation there, and it'll give you a list of all of the projects Community Foundation has going on, and you can just choose uh, the Alexander Memorial, or you can go straight to their foundation page uh, and do it from there. So. There's also a link on the Monroe County Bicentennial website. Uh, and I've also offered that, you know, if, if, if you or, you know, children, grandchildren, whatever, you know, color a page uh, in the coloring book and you want it posted on the, on the Facebook page, I'm more than happy to do that as well. Uh, it's $2 uh, per, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but I will post it if you send it to me. We're more than happy to, to share those. Uh, and it has been interesting. Uh, we've had a lot of longtime in Roe County uh, uh, residents, people that haven't lived here in 20, 30 years. Uh, you know, they've retired to Florida. We had another family in New York uh, that have contacted us through that Facebook page and said, you know, oh, my family is related to the Alexanders, or I grew up having picnics under underneath that memorial or, you know, I remember going to events downtown and, and being there at that. And so it's even beyond our local community, it's been something that people have connected back with. You talk about call for photographs out on Facebook? We have, yes. We've put a couple calls out on Facebook. Um, we've sent them out to most of the local history groups. That's what part of the reason I'm here today. Uh, this is your call. Uh, apparently there's an email thing that I can also get sent out to y'all uh, as well. Uh, but we, we're always looking for photographs. Uh, the more photographs we have, you never know when they're going to come in to be important. So we'll pretty much take anything. Uh, I'm more than happy to, to look at them. Don't get your hopes up, but uh, my mother was a semi-professional photographer years ago here in Bloomington, and I've got a large quantity of her negatives that I inherited. Okay. I've been through them all. In the past, I don't remember anything of this memorial, but I know she has taken, and I have had the pleasure to look at the negative of the World War II mm -hmm. memorial of the soldier with the hand grenade. Uh -huh. uh, and she took that in the studio while the two cars. Huh. Okay. So I will go through them again and look. I don't remember, you know, when I'm 72 years old, so sometimes that may be a problem. But I don't remember anything. Specifically taken of this, but I will double check, make sure I have more work. Okay. <laughs> well, and, and, and you know, part of my work is also making sure that our folks, so Brad Cook, who you all know, IU photo archivist, you know, he's got 1.8 million photos. Um, you know, he's like, I don't know if I have any, but I'll keep looking, uh, you know. <laughs> Uh, and there's times that he's hit like a collection of things and, and he will literally grab whatever grad student is working for him and be like, look for pictures of this thing. If you see any of these, pull them out. 
Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's letting, putting people on the alert for it. Um, you know, I'm waiting for the day we do one of these presentations and somebody goes, oh, hold on, I'll email it to you. I've got that photo right here. Uh, you know, it's a lot more of asking people to go back and dig through and, and look at the photos that they have. Um, I, in my mind, somewhere there's a family picnic photo uh, from some July 4th celebration in 1940, whatever, um, that you know we haven't seen yet. That's going to have this in the background. So. Yeah. Any other questions? Anything else? Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't. We don't really have an answer. Um, you know, I don't. The question was, if we do a whole complete Alexander, if we do like the the top, what would we do with him, uh, or the if the the panels themselves, what would we do? Um, I got a feeling he's uh, a little heavier than the ninety pounds that he he probably looks like he is. Uh, and so, you know, we'd have to figure out what kind of the long-term thing might be there. Uh, it might make a great decoration piece for, you know, the library or the history center or something like that. Uh, so we'll just have to see. Yeah. All right, well, I'll be around for a few. We have coloring books for sale up here if you would like to pick up a coloring book. Uh, and if you have any other questions after this, you can, if you uh, go to veterans.indiana.edu, you can find my contact information. Uh, if you just ask anybody on campus about the veterans office, they can direct you to me uh, and our work. Uh, and so thank you all.